Let's just give it a, a, a minute. I think uh, the participants are being are joining now. We have about 108 particip participants now on. Uh, I think we're still, Zoom is still sending the participants in. So let's give it another two minutes. Okay, I think the number of participants has more or less stabilized. So um, we'll let people continue joining, but maybe we'll just kick it off. So since we have a long night ahead of us. So um, thank you everyone for joining us tonight. Uh, uh, it, uh, this is the Ophthalmic Brachytherapy Workshop organized by uh, uh, the Singapore National Eye Center, ENZ and um, Transmedic. Um, so we would have another, we have a two hour session for us, um, uh, followed by a Q and A at the end, uh, where you can ask questions. Uh, I just want to give everyone a brief overview of how the webinar will work. Uh, if you're not familiar, you can, uh, for any questions, you can post them in the Q and A box. You'll see that at the bottom of the screen, uh, just like in this, um, this, this screenshot of the zoom window. So click the Q&A box and you will be able to uh, type your questions there. Um, this will be answered at the end of the workshop at 10, 10 o'clock. For any comments that you have other than questions, um, feel free to just post them in the chat box. Um, we, 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 we are um, 
open to, I mean, seeing anything, any, any comments in the chat box because uh, I think participants are muted for this webinar. So you would not be able to um, voice it out. Um, anyway, this session is recorded. So we will be sending a registration link uh, at the end so that you can access it on demand or share it with anyone, any, uh, anyone else that might want to join this. So without further ado, I would like to introduce um, the chairman and moderator of this workshop, uh, who is uh, Associate Professor Dr. Gavin Tan from Singapore National Eye Center. He's a senior consultant uh, in the surgical retinal department of the Singapore National Eye Center and Changi General Hospital. Uh, in addition, he's a clinician scientist at the Singapore Eye Research Institute and an associate professor with Duke NUS Graduate Medical School. Dr. Gavin Tan is a trained surgical and medical vitreal retinal specialist with a clinical interest in diabetic retinopathy, age-related re age macular degeneration, intraocular tumors, retinal detachments, and pediatric vitreal retinal diseases. He set up the first ocular plaque brachytherapy service in Singapore in conjunction with the National Cancer Center Singapore and is a visiting pediatric retinal surgeon at KK Women and Children's Hospital. He's also a highly trained, uh, experienced cataract surgeon with expertise in complicated and dislocated cataracts and intraocular lens fixation. Dr. Tan's research interest is in diabetic eye disease, retinal imaging, and artificial intelligence and has, more, uh, has published over 70 peer-reviewed papers. He's the clinical director of the SNEC Ocular Reading Center and the lead for diabetic, diabetic complications at the Singh Health Duke and US Diabetes Center. Dr. Gavin, as the head of the SNEC Digital Transformation Office, has a keen interest in developing artificial intelligence, uh, virtual imaging clinics, and home monitoring solution to address the constraints of medical care under the new normal of COVID-19. So um, uh, can I just hand it over to Dr. Gavin uh, to moderate the lab? To Hi, good evening, everybody. Uh, Thank thanks you. to uh, Transmedic for organizing this session. Um, we're very pleased to have a very esteemed faculty here, and we hope this will be a very useful session to help um, the audience understand a little bit more about ophthalmic brachytherapy in the treatment or the management of uh, ocular oncology and other diseases. Um, so to start off today, we have a very, very esteemed speaker. He's a friend. He has visited Singapore many times. I'm sure he's visited many places around the world um, among the people in the audience. So Professor Arun Singh is the Director of Ophthalmic Oncology at the Cole Institute Cleveland Clinic. He's published hundreds and hundreds of articles and major textbooks on ocular oncology, and he's currently the Editor-in-Chief of Ophthalmic and Oncology and Pathology. He really needs um, no introduction to the people who, who are in this field. And we're very pleased to have him talk to us about the overview of the status of the current treatment uh, methods. Uh, Professor Singh. Thank you very much. And good, good evening to all of you. Let me start my screen here. Continue. Uh, can you all see my screen now? So I'm grateful to uh, the Singapore National Eye Center, also uh, to the Eckerton Ziegler and Transmedic for sponsoring and inviting me to participate with this uh, distinguished faculty. Uh, I think webinars are a useful, efficient way of uh, learning. And then of course, if it in interests you, you can go somewhere and visit and learn further. So just to talk about ophthalmic brachytherapy, I think this is what I do every day for many years now. And this is uh, very important and my favorite topic. So thanks again for, for, the, for giving me this, this topic. Uh, I'm at the Cleveland Clinic. Let me see here. Why am I not able to move my slide? Um, do I have to do something different to move my slide forward? Yeah. yeah. Okay, it's working now. So I'm at the uh, Cola Institute of Cleveland Clinic, been there for almost 20 years now. 
So over the next uh, 20 minutes or so, give after a brief introduction, we'll talk about the indications. And you're going to hear about uveal melanoma as the main indication and that what it is. But there are several other uh, indications that where bracket therapy is very effective. And I'll briefly touch upon complications because complications are what leads us to innovation, to avoid complications. So that's an important part of where we will be headed, I guess, in the future. And the radiation principles will be covered by Dr. Roy, uh, who is a radiation oncologist from Singapore. So uh, patients always ask me, and I want to share this with you, that uh, ocular bracket therapy is nothing new. It's been there for more than 100 years. Uh, this is the oldest reference that I can find. I don't have much literature on this particular article. It's in German, but uh, they do refer to the use of radium-228. But in common ophthalmic textbooks, we are having a slightly different history. And uh, this is a source article where you can go and read all about, uh, you know, dosing and efficacy and recurrences, et cetera, a whole uh, systematic review for uveal melanoma brachytherapy. And we talk about history here. So coming back to what we are normally understanding that the credit goes to Foster Moore from uh, England and London. Uh, who came up with the idea of uh, doing uh, radiation uh, therapy for uveal melanoma. And here's an uh, x-rays of that from his uh, article and that goes many years ago. Let me move the panel out of here. And you can see, uh, let us see, the radon seed has been inserted through the sclera into the tumor and was left there. This looks almost like what people do for prostate. They put the seeds and the seeds kind of uh, go on for a long time. And this was published in 1930, and this is 2021. So think about that. And then, of course, there has been uh, other people, and notably Stallard, who came up with the present-day design of plaque as we use it, and that's cobalt-60. And he published that. This article came out in, like, in the 60s. And then, of course, we have from uh, Germany, uh, Peter Lomash, who designed the ruthenium implant, and, and Carmen and... Um, Eichert and Siegler Company, of course, is based in Germany. But he was from Leipzig, so I don't know whether... Have you moved to Leipzig or you're in Berlin now? You're in Berlin, right, Carmen? Uh, are you uh, based in... The company, the company is in Berlin, and at that time, uh, Lomach was also in Berlin. So we oh, stayed okay. in Berlin. He moved to Leipzig. Okay, he moved to Leipzig. So there is East Germany and West Germany. You can understand the politics. Okay, let's carry on. So that's in 1970s. And... Next to him um, in this photograph is his uh, radiation physicist. Um, he, he died a year or two ago, I think, and they mentioned this to me. But that's, uh, so I do want to recognize the role of radiation physicists. Wherever you're working, you need them. Without them, you cannot do any, any brachytherapy. So where are we nowadays? We are using iodine plaque. This is COMS plaque, Collaborative Ocular Melanoma Study, and that goes back to 1980s. And that was by Packer and Rodman, and they described it, and it was adapted to the COMS. So in the US, particularly, we are using, still many places, are using the COMS design plaque, which is, of course, about 25 years old. So we'll come back to this a little bit later. The indications, you'll hear about melanoma, so I'm going to skip that part. But just to say that you can also use it for conjunctival tumors, retinal tumors, and other uveal tumors. So let's take some examples. for. Here's a patient with ocular surface neoplasia, CIN, but was invasive. So it's not CIN, it's a squamous cell carcinoma invasive. And after topical therapy, when the biopsy was done, he had invasive component into the sclera. And for that, you had to use radiation. And here's a radiation implant applied directly to the conjunctiva, covered with tutoplast so as to minimize irritation, left for about 48 hours. And when you're given about 45 gray, you can see all the tumor went away. No reference, slight cataract. So stromal invasion or scleral invasion is an important indication for brachytherapy. Here's a patient with a multifocal conjunctival melanoma. You can see a melanoma on this side. You see a melanoma on such so a bilimbal, um, nasal and temporal. This is melanoma here. And you can see on the UBM, you can clearly see a scleral and corneal invasion it will be very difficult for you to excise this completely. You don't know how deep to go and you'll end up having complications. For a case like this, radiation implants, so since she had 
bilimbal melanoma, we put two plaques, one at one time, and then move to the other area of the same eye. And after six months, you can see all the pigmentation and melanoma is gone. And she was recurrence free for many years. She did get radiation cataract that was taken care of. Here's a patient who had a kind of ill-defined uh, stromal malignant tumor of the conjunctiva. He's a renal transplant, so he's immunosuppressed. And he had multiple excisions and comes in with a big tumor sitting there on the surface of the eye. Was a lyomyosarcoma. Initially, it was then changed to myofibrosarcoma. Again, a malignant stromal tumor. And we plagued him. We had to do three times. First for the main tumor, and then he had marginal recurrences. So this is, in my mind, in the history of ophthalmic bracket therapy, the largest number of plaques that you can use, three on the surface of the eye. He, of course, developed cataract, was taken off, his vision is 2020, almost at five years out, no radiation retinopathy. Again, we know this radiation from the surface is not significant to reach the macula. But cataract, of course, is expected. Other common, other indications is in the uvea, and I'm moving to intraocular, is a choroidal hemangioma. I know most of us would try to do PDT for it, but if there's a lot of fibrosis and if there's detachment around it, brachytherapy can be done. So this patient had brachytherapy for circumscribed choroidal hemangioma. Patient with a metastasis, solitary metastasis, unable to travel for multiple radiation exposures from external beam, was treated with a plaque applied to this iridociliary metastasis from, from the renal cancer. So that's the other indication you can use. Another thing that's been overlooked in recent years is retinoblastoma can also be treated with plaque brachytherapy. So here's a child with bilateral tumor. One eye had been enucleated, and here's a tumor. You know, one nowadays we say this is a group C tumor with intra, with using the international classification. We can see localized seeding and detachment around it. You can use IAC for it if you have it, but otherwise you can also do a plaque. And that's what we did for this patient. Ten years later, she's 2020 vision. Here's a child, I hope this came many years ago from Syria, um, couldn't come back again for multiple treatments with tumor in the macula. I did a plaque therapy and this is many years later. Uh, it's a regressed tumor. One application, one therapy, no multiple hospitalizations. A patient with a juxtapapillary retinoblastoma had multiple recurrences, put a notched plaque on it and you can see how the tumor went away. So nowadays we have IAC, but in some places where you don't have it, or you want to avoid IAC for some other reason, then this is a good alternative. Patient with the focal recurrence after intravenous chemotherapy, TTT, cryo, you can put a plaque on. So there are indications in retinoblastoma for persistent or recurrent or primary retinoblastoma if it's a unifocal disease. And this is our results, almost 85% control rate is excellent. Let's move to the next slide. Very briefly about the isotopes, and you're going to hear more about the radionuclides. In, the, in Europe and Asia, people predominantly use ruthenium-106. In the US, we are using iodine-125. And then this is the way that things have developed and some marketing forces. But I think in the US, it's mostly driven by COMS that chose iodine-125. And there's a reason. Otherwise, to economic reason, we know ruthenium works out cheaper if you use it for multiple times, and it's easy to handle if you don't have a elaborate departments of radiation physics, then it may be a choice for you. There's an advantage with ruthenium because think about it, so it's a more focused or local source, so the scatter or collateral damage is low or less, and so you can use it for smaller tumors up to five millimeters, but at the same time, the radiation uh, scatter is less. So talk about main complications from brachytherapy is vision loss, radiation retinopathy, and almost 50% of patients will lose vision. As of now, radiation retinopathy is not treatable. Multiple uh, treatments and uh, are being explored, uh, experiments and trials have been uh, undertaken, but we have no effective therapy. So one way to manage that is to avoid radiation retinopathy. Well, how can you avoid it? Because we know it's dose dependent. So if you can cut down the dose of radiation, then that's one way to avoid radiation retinopathy. And 
So you can choose an isotope I just mentioned. You can choose for, say, a three millimeter tumor or four millimeter tumor. You may choose ruthenium over iodine and you may reduce the risk of radiation retinopathy. So this is a ruthenium 106 plaque, and this is, of course, sold by Eckert and Ziegler. Uh, and they are the sponsors of this uh, thing. But just to let you know, this is being used. We use it in the past. We continue to use it. And other people use it all over the world. And it has certain advantages, particularly for smaller tumors. You can see how the isodoses are more compact, so the scatter is less. Here's a patient with small melanoma, was treated. And you can see after 10 year follow up, his vision is normal. But why is his vision normal? Why and how come the other patients lose vision? It's all about the dose to the structures. So if you go back and look at the dose to his macula and optic disc, had I used iodine for this patient, he would have had dose of more than 45 gray to the disc and macula. But by using ruthenium, we minimize the exposure. So in some certain cases, you can select an isotope to help you preserve vision. And that's all dose dependent. So you must pay attention to the dose to the vision critical structures, such as optic disc and macula. In fact, based on these calculations, we have developed a predictive model for predicting who's going to lose vision. It's all dose dependent. Okay. And then we talk about efficacy. In properly balanced studies, they're equivalent. You can use, use ruthenium, but yeah, only for tumors that are less than five. And the other isotopes for sometimes medium-sized tumors is palladium, also equally effective. And just think about it, I just mentioned to you that COMS plaque has been used for, you know, since 1985, and now this is a 2020, more than 25 years. And there's nothing in your life that's 25 years old. No technology that you use is 25 years old. And how come we are stuck with the COMS design? So iPhysics is a company uh, in the US who has tried to develop a newer design of a plaque. And this is called EP iPhysics 917. That we, uh, we use it. And uh, there's some advantage in the way that the radiation comes out of it. And there's some kind of shielding effect in the basic design. So in about 15% of cases, uh, it can say, improve vision. If let me just put it in a very broad term. And then what's the local control of overall in brachytherapy? We talk about brachytherapy and it's exciting and it's new and you can save eye and some vision, but control rate is approximately 95% for uveal melanomas. And this is important to understand. Most of the recurrences happen in the first five years. Most of the recurrences are marginal. That means it's either underestimation of tumor size or improper placement of the plaque. So pay attention to the margins, either by exam or by photography, uh, to look for recurrences. And then people talk about the dose, can we reduce the dose? The dose for melanoma is 85 gray and it's apical dose, while it's empirically dry, uh, derived. Can be reduced? Yes. Do we have data that's, that's safe? We don't have that data. But this number will come up time and again, and we are kind of stuck with it. And the last thing I want to talk about is that during brachytherapy, we do intraoperative V scan ultrasound to confirm the placement of the plaque. I think that will improve your control rate, will reduce your recurrences because you are confirmed where you are when you're putting the brachytherapy. Thank you so much for allowing me to contribute. I know these are scattered thoughts, but in 20 minutes, that's all we can do. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Singh. Um, so that was a very useful introduction about the treatment with ophthalmic brachytherapy. Um, so we'll go on to the, the next talk and, and I'm going to speak myself a little bit of introduction into our own experience in applying brachytherapy in Singapore, as well as a, a, an overview of the use of, for the treatment of uveal melanoma. Let, give me a second to start this. Okay, thanks everybody for your attention. Let me just make sure you can hear me, good. So uh, I think uh, Dr. Singh has given a very good introduction into brachytherapy, how this is not something that's new or fancy. It's a treatment modality that's been around for years. Um, it's a form of radiotherapy. So essentially in brachytherapy, a radiation source is placed within tissue to kill the malignant cells. 
And this allows a higher dose of radiation directly to the treatment area and potentially providing less damage to the surrounding tissue as compared to something externally applied like external beam radiotherapy. So the indications uh, has already been gone through. So I'm gonna focus on the indication of uveal melanoma for most of the rest of my talk. So uveal melanoma is the most common primary malignant tumor in adults. Um, it occurs in about six per million in Caucasian populations. And it's less common in Asian countries and, and the reported incident ranges anywhere from about 0.3 to 1 per million in Asia. There are predisposing lesions like nevuses, the presence of melanosis and melanocytoma. Uh, the mean age tends to be about 60 years old in Caucasians. It's younger in Asians. Uh, the various studies range from about 45 to 55. And they, they are sometimes symptomatic with vision loss, scotoma, photopsia, metamorphopsia, but they can often present late um, when the tumor is actually not posterior, where it will affect the vision early. <clears throat> So there are many features. It can be pigmented or it can be amelanotic. You often see subrenal fluid, uh, orange pigmentation, hemorrhages. Uh, the important thing that allows us to diagnose this tumor, and that's a critical part of the management, is imaging. So ultrasound is key. You usually look for certain features such as acoustic hollowness, um, high initial spike with low internal reflectivity. FA and ICG can also be useful. They tend to present with, there isn't a pattern, a pattern but they tend to have some early hyperfluorescence and as well as accompanied by late um, hyperfluorescence uh, with, with staining. Rarely, they may have the classic double circulation, but I think FAICG is very useful in helping you to identify the other differentials uh, outside of a melanoma. In OCT, they may show subretinal fluid, shadowy retinal changes, and shadowing uh, behind the tumor. So this table, I think, is actually from one of the articles written by Arun, which kind of summarizes the different imaging findings of the various common lesions that you need to differentiate from a choroidal melanoma. And again, that's quite important as I'll go on later and, and explain, uh, because unlike a lot of tumors, the primary diagnosis is often made without having histological diagnosis. So when you have decided that the lesion that you're seeing in the patient's eye is a melanoma, you need to do a systemic ev evaluation. Liver meds are the most common, uh, although you can get lung, bone, and skin and other metastasis as well. So usual basic test would be an LFT. You would want to do some systemic and liver imaging. In our context, we were using PET-CT whole body scans. Uh, you may want for surveillance, look at the liver in particular with MRI, ultrasound, or CT. And as I mentioned, biopsy of the lesions is usually only considered if there's diagnostic doubt. So the overall management uh, besides brachytherapy, I'm just going to briefly cover. In very small tumors, we, we do often talk about periodic observation. And this is to document growth before you treat. And when we say small tumors, we're really talking about tumors less than 2.5 millimeters in size. And we want to look at whether it's got any high risk features that might suggest it's more likely to grow or have malignant uh, transformation. And we know from data from comms and other studies that having these high risk feature increases the chance that these tumors are likely to grow or become what we call malignant uh, within a certain amount of time. So when they have multiple high-risk feature, your uh, trigger to treat may be much, much lower. So uh, if you've decided that these, uh, this lesion is a tumor, one of the primary th therapies available for uveal melanoma is radiotherapy. It can be proton beam therapy, but proton beam therapy tends to have a very limited outreach because it's got a very, very high uh, setup cost and only very, very small number of centers and countries even have that available. What's more commonly used is plaque brachytherapy. And there are many options as, as Aru mentioned earlier. Um, the indications here would really be the medium tumors. Generally, you talk about a thickness of somewhere between 2.5 to 10 medium liters. And you also have a maximal basis. If the tumor is too large, it becomes difficult to get a plaque that will cover the entire um, expanse of the tumor. And the important study um, that really drove the popularity of this modality of treatment is the COM study, which found the important thing, no significant difference in survival between patients who had the globe-sparing iodine-125 uh, plaque brachytherapy compared with a nucleation. So what happens in, in this study was an, in radio brachytherapy is a plaque is placed over the tumor and it's a goal to deliver a minimum dose to the whole tumor. And the magic number as <laughs> was easily mentioned earlier was 85 grays, but there are various studies trying to establish whether a lower dose can have equally efficacious outcomes. And local control is good, as Dr. Singh mentioned. There are other therapeutic options you may also want to consider. 
for very small tumors, transpupillary tumor therapy might be an option. Um, there are various centers who have had success with local uh, resection, which in that may be better to preserve vision, but they have a very much higher risk of complications. Long-term survival is still a little bit uncertain, and the success with these uh, complicated surgical procedures tend to be limited to a few small hands. So it's not something you could scale up and easily provide to a larger population. Of course, larger tumors do require, require a nucleation. And of course, if there's local spread, it may also require orbital exaggeration. So outcomes with ocular brachytherapy, we talked a little bit about local control, um, but it's good to just have a look at what the collaborative ocular melanoma study found. So to understand the basis for our treatment, this was a randomized control trial with more than 1,300 patients, and they compared iodine versus a nucleation. An important finding here is about 27-28% of patients in both arms passed away after the, during the follow-up period, and of that 28%, about 60% were due to metastatic uh, melanoma confirmed or, sus or suspected. So in both groups, there was an equal mortality rate, and obviously you spare the globe by not enucleating it. They also found the diagnostic accuracy um, based on the, their kind of diagnostic criteria was good. So that's very important. So we know we don't need to have histological diagnosis to um, confirm these tumors. And, but you also do need to know that this is a, even though it's a globe sparing uh, therapy, there was still a small number of patients um, that still required enucleation, the brachytherapy arm, uh, the majority of which were for treatment failure. And the risk of treatment failure overall here was about 10%, but more recent papers have suggested it's 5% or lower for various uh, reasons that I will just briefly discuss later. So the risk factors for treatment failure, as you would expect, is greater tumor thickness, older age, and of course, closer proximity to the fovea vascular zone. So if we talk about prognosis, it really depends on many, many factors, and it's important to understand when you're treating. And um, there is a quite, quite a wide acceptance why we don't really make that much of a difference towards the, the long-term mortality uh, in whether whichever modality of treatment you choose is often there's already micrometastasis that may have already been present when the tumor is diagnosed. And those are the ones that drive the um, short and medium term uh, mortality rate. And there are many, many um, prognostic factors that have been identified. It's, it's too much to go through in detail in this talk. Uh, but know that we have the general anatomical histopathological predictors and what has become increasingly important are genetic uh, predictors, whether it's chromosomal changes or re more recently, there's good evidence that gene expression profiles can give a, a pretty reliable um, prediction of the patient's risk for systemic metastasis at five years. So as any therapy it is, it is not without complications. Um, I think Dr. Singh mentioned earlier, a radiation retinopathy is one of the major complications and that it results in capillary fallout, ischemia, as well as maculopathy, macular edema. Um, there are various ways to try and manage and treat these diseases, none of which are extremely effective, but they do include anti-VEGF, steroids, laser. Other complications include radiation optic neuropathy, cataract, um, which can be easily managed, as well as neovascular glaucoma. And in studies, they show that this occurs at a rate ranging anywhere from 4 to 20 percent, um, occurring at a mean of about two years. And the rate of enucleation secondary to neovascular glaucoma after iodine brachytherapy range from about 1 to 12 percent. You can also have surface symptoms and complications from radiation. That includes dry eyes, keratitis, and sclerothinic. So given all this, what do the visual outcomes look like? So we know we are primarily a globe sparing therapy, but we do preserve some vision. It's not ideal. In the comms at three years, they found that 49% of eyes had a six-line loss, and overall, 43% of eyes had vision uh, equal or worse than 2200. This was compared to 10% of baseline, so 33% are new cases of very poor vision after ocular barrier therapy. Other studies have noted um, that maybe 30%, slightly more, can maintain 612 or better in the long term. And, but we generally accept if you're looking at longer term follow-up uh, that goes beyond five or 10 years, that only about 40 to 60% will maintain 660 or better vision. And this is a summary of the various studies that have looked at mean vision after brachytherapy. But we also know that um, there have been recent reports that people trying to do various things to improve these both local recurrence as well as visual outcomes um, in brachytherapy. 
uh, a recent study from uh, Carol Shields groups have looked at using prophylactic bezivizumab in their eyes and their patients that undergo brachytherapy treatment for uveal melanoma. And they found compared to historical controls, and that's a very limited, because this is a retrospective comparative and not an RCT, they found medium vision at various time points was much better in a group where they gave this four monthly bevacizumab prophylactic treatment over two years. There are other factors that can also improve the outcomes after brachytherapy. I think improved plug design and planning, and um, Dr. Singh mentioned those earlier. Some people have talked a lot about how improving surgical techniques is important. And again, ultrasound placement was mentioned, and that can reduce local recurrence as low as 1% in one paper. There are also radiation dose uh, adjustments where we are starting to look at whether 85 is really that magic number that, that's really required. But again, we really need good long-term data for us to use those kind of targets with confidence. Various is different isotopes may also have different complication rates, as mentioned. Rutinium had, do, does have some advantages. And there have been some groups that have tried to combine vitrectomy and silicon all with plug placement in larger tumors in order to attenuate the radiation dose to the other parts of the eye. So uh, the important thing that we learned in our experience is ophthalmic brachytherapy is really a multidisciplinary team approach. Um, I think uh, Dr. Aaron talked about the radiation physic physicist being critical. In our own context, we, we work very closely as well with the physicists and the radiation oncologists in order to deliver our therapy. And our kind of clinical protocol works where the ophthalmologist makes the clinical diagnosis, makes the measurements, uh, starts the investigations for metastasis. We also refer to our radiation oncology team for uh, assessment. And we, we have a team that, that meets up to decide the suitability for brachytherapy and then go on to do the planning uh, for the treatment, which um, my colleague, uh, Dr. Xiao, will talk about later. And once that is done, then the patient actually receives the plug brachytherapies surgery uh, with a, a time removal of this plug in order to ensure that the correct dose of radiation is delivered. Um, I'll just very quickly show a video. There's really no time to talk in detail about the surgical procedure, but a lot of it is uh, it's, it's quite similar to what uh, those in the audience have been doing, sclerobuckles have been doing. So here we are trying to marking and identifying where the tumor is. You can see it transilluminates in pigmented tumors very nicely and you can mark up um, an accurate uh, surface localization. Once you have that surface localization, then you can actually place the plug. And when the plug is, is placed, you can also use transillumination again to identify the position. There we are doing a, a, a fine needle aspiration biopsy, which is part of our protocol that allows molecular diagnostics to be done. Um, and after we are, we are sure of the positioning, we will place the actual radiation plug. Um, in our protocol, we also do ultrasound localization after the plug is in place to ensure the, the placement is as accurate as possible and the conch is closed, um, just like you would after placing any buckle or tube kind of procedure. And depending on the exposure time required, anywhere from a two to in our practice, usually about seven days and the plug will be removed. So the follow-up post brachytherapy is also uh, very important, a part of the management. Um, in our own practice, we, we review them at a four to six monthly basis uh, to perform serial measurements and look for changes in the tumor, uh, in particular, looking for local recurrence. Uh, we do normally expect the tumors not to shrink uh, straight away. It does take time for some uh, change in size to be present. And it, it must be acknowledged, they don't regress completely. So we do have a lot of patients who have had treatment and gone back to their primary uh, ophthalmologist to review. And the ophthalmologist needs to realize that the, the tumor is not going to disappear completely after treatment. And what's important is to monitor for changes in size. We also need to do systemic um, monitoring. And in our context, it's a six monthly imaging that alternates between a whole body pet and local liver imaging. So I'm just going to discuss a few cases that just highlights the, uh, the use of uh, brachytherapy that we've had. So my first patient is a 76-year-old Chinese male with diabetes, is an ex-smoker. He has an ocular history of right eye polypoidal choroidal vasculopathy, who's had PDT and multiple anti-VEGF injections. And the primary uh, treating retina physician also noted a left choroidal mass on his presentation uh, with AMD. So at this point of time, the right eye vision was still good, 6'9". The left eye was also uh, pinhole the 6'9 vision. 
Um, we, you can see up here in the superior nasal region, there's a large choroidal, pigmented choroidal mass. And on ultrasonography, um, the important features that we see, there was a high internal initial spike, very low internal reflectivity, acoustic hollowing on the B scan, and the max height of the tumor here was about 6.4 millimeters. We generally in our system also do other imaging to, to confirm the localization. Uh, and we often do MRI as well as part of our protocol. And there was a workup done that included a PET scan and there was no metastasis or low extraocular extension noted for this patient. So planning was done. My colleague will talk a little bit more about this later. But in this case, we used an eight millimeter com plug with iodine-125 seeds with a 48 hour exposure time. And we do look at the kind of exposure that the other structures receive as well. So the outcome in this patient, um, he, he had a um, biopsy, five needle biopsy done. It showed, although it's an epithelial tumor, the tumor actually had high risk chromosomal abnormalities. Uh, he has been followed up for about 30 months. There's no metastasis. Uh, there's mild radiation retinopathy changes noted, but he's got no maculopathy. And he had a left phacal malsification cataract surgery done nine months after the brepi therapy because he was starting to develop a radiation-induced cataract. And in this patient, it's very fortunate we had, this was actually our first patient um, that had this modality available because uh, soon after, we know in PCV, you tend, can often maintain good vision in the initial uh, years, but very often these cases do have uh, severe hemorrhagic episodes where they can get permanent vision loss in spite of regular anti vegf treatment. And in his case right now, his vision in the right eye that had a PCV has declined to 660. The left eye still maintains 612 vision at almost three years. And as you can see, there's still a residual tumor there, although it's shrunk compared to the original images. And in, in this case, he does have um, um, intermediate AMD in the left eye as well. The second case is a 40-year-old Vietnamese woman presenting to us with right blurring of vision for two months. Um, and the vision in the right eye was 621 pinholeable to 612. Um, you can see there's an area of subretinal fluid there as well as a, a tumor just superior to the uh, superior temporal to the macula. Again, this tumor shows the high inter uh, the low internal reflectivity with a high initial spike and in acoustic hollowing. There was SRF noted on the OCT. In this case, it was actually an amelanotic or non-pigmented tumor. And based on our workup, we diagnosed an amelanotic melanoma. Uh, the metastatic screen was negative. The height was 3.9 millimeters. This is quite a posterior location. So because it was a, a slightly smaller tumor with posterior location, we decided to use a ruthenium plaque uh, instead. And this was with the intention to reduce the collateral exposure and damage. And as has been shown later, with ruthenium plaques, the, the radiation uh, exposure lines tend to be uh, uh, much closer together and you get much quicker fallout. So just moving a few millimeters away from the treatment zone, the amount of exposure in terms of grays is much, much less than you would uh, normally expect in an iodine treatment. So here, her outcome, she had a mixed cell type. Um, she's had two year follow-up in Vietnam. We not, she has not been reported to have any mats of growth and the vision was maintained at about 618 in this eye at two years. Uh, the third case is a, a 47 year old. We also tend to, this was also a Vietnamese woman uh, for just by chance. She had a, a pre-existing wrist lesion. So here she had a left uh, nevus of Ota and she presented, this lady was not a Singapore resident. She came in from Vietnam. She presented there with blurring of vision and she was diagnosed with a melanoma and recommended an inflation. So she came for looking for alternative treatments. On presentation, she had 630 vision in this left eye. You can see this whole um, pigmented area where the nevus of Ota are. And within that, there was a choroidal tumor that was actually affecting the, directly in the macula, which is why the vision was worse in this case compared to the other cases. Um, there were characteristics consistent with a um, uveal melanoma. So if she was diagnosed with a nevus of Ota with a um, secondary malignant change, a choroidal melanoma. Uh, the maximum height here was six millimeters and the metastatic workup was negative and she went for iodine, sorry, one, two, five plaque therapy. therapy. And in this case, because as you can imagine, in the earlier video, we showed the transilluminating lesion that's, tra that's traditionally used as the primary means of placement. But here, the whole um, area of the choroid is all pigmented. So on transillumination, you really could not define the edges of the tumor well. And in these, 
this is one particular case where having ultrasonography guided surgical placement is very, very important and very useful. And there was quite immediate uh, reduction in the tumor height within six months. Um, unfortunately, because of COVID, I have not seen her in a while, but from what I understand uh, from our international patient service, she, locally, she's had her systemic surveillance done and there was no recurrence of met and vision is maintained. Not great, but at 645. So in conclusion, ophthalmic brachytherapy is an effective modality of treatment for choroidal melanomas. It's primarily gold sparing, but you can preserve a fair amount of uh, good vision in the long, medium to long term. Uh, ultrasound and multimodal imaging is really useful or essential to provide an accurate diagnosis. And patients really require multidisciplinary care and long-term follow-up in order to ensure that they are, you can manage the local recurrences and you can surveil them for metastasis. Okay, thank you very much everybody for your attention. And next, um, I'd like to introduce a, a series of speakers who will, who will give us a little bit more information about the prevailing eye malignant uh, situation within their countries that will help everybody in the audience uh, better understand what kind of needs that we have that are unmet and how we can work together towards meeting those needs. So first I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Tengu Ain. Uh, she's a, a good old friend that we've known for many, many years. She spent some time in Singapore years ago. Uh, she's an associate professor of uh, surgery at the University of Malaya. And she'll be talking about the ocular oncology situation in Malaysia. Let me stop screen sharing. Right. Thank you very much, Gavin. That's very kind of you. Um, Prof Arun, fellow panelists, organizers, thank you for in the invitation to speak. Um, hello everyone, I'm Tung Kuain. I come from Kuala Lumpur and I shall be uh, presenting the topic given, which is the prevailing eye cancer situation in Malaysia. So um, I've got no financial disclosures to make related to the talk. Uh, before I begin, I'd like to acknowledge the following for some of the uh, contributions to the content of this talk. Uh, the Malaysian National Cancer Registry, the Ministry of Health, Dr. Fariza, the Head of Service, Dr. Roslin, uh, who's dealing a lot with ocular oncology, medical retina team um, in Shalam and KL, and also uh, from Noliza and her team at my hospital. So this is the contents of my talk uh, uh, as an overview about uh, Malaysia and the population and where we go from there in terms of eye cancers. So um, most of you know this, this is the map of Malaysia. Uh, we, we, uh, we have the West uh, Peninsula Malaysia. We've got several states on the Borneo Island, the northern part. Uh, we've got 13 states and three federal territories. Some of these uh, are in Malay. So this is a population estimate in 2020. We've got about almost 33 million people, um, of which almost 30 are citizens uh, in 2020. But um, the one in green is 2020 estimates and the one in maroon is 2019 estimates. Um, we don't have a very high population growth, growth rate uh, at the moment, it's only 0.4%. And this is the population characteristics. Uh, we've got almost uh, equally distributed male and females. Uh, for every 100 females, there's 106 males. That's about the same in 2020 and 2019. Um, we are a multi-racial and multi-ethnic uh, population. Um, six, most of majority, about 70% are um, Lays and other indigenous ethnic groups, followed by the Chinese, Indian and other ethnicities. Um, population characteristics by age, uh, most of our population is uh, aged between 15 to 64 years, as uh, is common in most developing countries. And that's our population pyramid, which generally shows uh, uh, quite a stable population. So uh, coming to the cancer spectrums in Malaysia, um, these are the top 10 cancers in the general population in Malaysia, um, of which um, as expected eye cancers are rare so they don't make the cut in the top 10. However, um, when, uh, when you divide that according to age, um, eye cancers, mainly retinoblastomas, is the top uh, the fifth top uh, eye uh, cancers in kids aged from birth to 14 years old. 
and they make up the ninth top cancer from birth to 19 years old. Um, this data is um, is given to me by courtesy from the uh, from Dr. Rosalie in Malaysian National Cancer Registry. Um, retinoblastoma makes up for uh, most of our top ocular cancers, uh, about um, about on the range of 20, 15 to 20 cases, new cases per year. You can see the drop in 2020. Uh, I think this is a direct link to uh, the restriction, the movement restriction order in due to the pandemic. Um, in terms of melanoma, related, um, these are all those that is related to this stock. In terms of uh, uveal melanoma, um, we saw 2018 uh, reported cases in public hospitals. Uh, there are only eight cases and about 11 cases in 2019. So on average, um, in a public hospital, we see about maybe 10 new cases. Um, this is not including any other non-public institutions. So I think this number is actually, the actual number is actually higher than this. Um, retinoblastoma registry uh, by the Ministry of Health. Uh, this data is from four major hospitals treating retinoblastomas for major public hospitals. Uh, one is in Kuala Lumpur, three is in Borneo, and uh, there are three other teaching institutions, uh, but which data are not included in this uh, presentation. Um, in the registry, there are about 25, 254 retinoblastoma cases registered since 2004, according to a 2018 NED report, um, of which, you can see 52% are bilateral. And most of those cases that present more than half are uh, quite late uh, at group E, 18 followed by group D. So uh, the spectrum of our cases that are being treated are actually in the late stages. What were the treatment modalities offered and available to them? Um, surgery, laser, radiotherapy. Uh, and on top of chemotherapy. I'll go into that in further detail afterwards. But I just wanted to show that um, those are since 2004, um, there were about 73% enucleation for unilateral cases and 37% in bilateral cases. 27% um, of unilateral cases had no extraocular extension. Um, eight cases is a smaller number in bilateral cases. So. Um, that's food for thought. Uh, in terms of radiotherapy, only eight people, uh, eight, eight patients receive radiotherapy. Of course, we do not have at this point plate, bra uh, plate brachytherapy for them. This was the outcome, but it's, uh, it's quite limited due to a lot of missing data. Um, at one year, 4.7% um, expired, Nine, about 10% were lost to follow up. Um, very more recently, Dr. Jamalia and her team at uh, Kuala Lumpur published this last year on the experience of intra-arterial chemotherapy in the first three and a half years, where they reported the outcomes of 14 eyes of 14 patients performed between 2014 to 2018, um, out of which, um, as mentioned earlier, 57 more than half were late presenters at Group D and Group E. Uh, they reported 19 months follow-up. Uh, globe salvation was reported in 38% and tumor regression was reported in 53%. So um, this is my last slide coming to the point of this talk, which is given, which is giving a snapshot about what is available and what is the cancer situation um, available uh, in Malaysia. So in terms of treatment modalities, the ocular, we have the laser, cryo, photodynamic therapies, uh, intra-arterial chemotherapy, intravitreal topical, and surgery. Um, in addition to systemic chemotherapy, EBRT, and IMRT. So what's our future direction um, in terms of ocular tumors? Uh, I think we should work towards national collaborative ocular tumor registries uh, involving both public and non-public institutions and hopefully we work towards split bracket therapy because the need is there. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Tago Ayn, for, for just letting us know what's, what's happening in your country. And it's, it's quite interesting for you 
RBA is, is a major problem. Unfortunately, in Singapore, with a very low birth rate, a retinoblastoma is quite an uncommon occurrence. We've had one or two cases where we had considered using a plug as an adjunctive, but in the end, the patient managed to respond to transpupillary tumor therapy, so they didn't need plug brachytherapy in the end. Um, so uh, next up, we have um, Dr. Gary John Mercado from the Philippines. Um, he's currently a, a um, clinical associate professor and oncology head at the Department of Ophthalmology in UP Manila PGH. And he'll be talking about the ocular oncology uh, situation, prevalence, and disease characteristics in the Philippines. Dr. Mercado? Yes. Uh, are you able to see the screen? Good evening. Are you able to see the screen? I think it's in presenter mode, so you might need to switch it. Okay. You just. Um... You may want to. Um, choose the other screen instead. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Let me get back here. Sorry. Sorry about that. Are we good? Great. Okay, let me just uh, figure this out. Well, good evening. Um, yeah, I'd like to thank the uh, um, organizers for inviting me uh, to participate in the series of talks on ocular oncology. I'm eager to learn about the uh, situation in, uh, of ocular oncology in this part of the, the Asia Pacific and uh, see the prospects of uh, the availability of uh, black uh, bracket therapy for our patients. I'm glad to see uh, Arun. Uh, it's been a while that I haven't seen him from way back in uh, Philadelphia and uh, I'm honored to also be with uh, Dr. Tan and the rest of the team. Okay, thank you. So um, I'm an invited speaker, Transmedic. To start, allow me to brief you about the Philippines and our healthcare system. The Philippines is an archipelago composed of 7,641 islands. And these islands are divided into three main island groups, Luzon, Visayas, and Mindanao. The majority- Hello. Sorry, Dr. Mercado, excuse me. Uh, I think your screen is on uh, presenter view. Oh, I'm yeah. so sorry. sorry. Yeah, I think earlier it was it was working. That's good. Yeah. You can try to switch. Okay. Sorry about this. Um, up here. Yep, now it's uh, on presenter view. Could I just try this here and uh, see if, uh, yeah, anyway. Okay, let me go back one slide. Yeah, so we do have, uh, it's governed as a unitary state and it's um, coming from Manila, which is in the national capital region. However, we, have, we do have our local government units of, uh, comprising 17 administrative regions and 81 provinces. The population is a whopping 110 million and uh, they have a very high growth rate. However, a, a third of this uh, population is in the uh, national capital region as well as in the uh, adjacent uh, provinces around the NCR. In 2009, there are 90,370 physicians. That's about one per 833 persons. Uh, a review of the hospitals in 2018 showed that there's 1,258 hospitals that are registered at the Department of, of uh, Department of Health, uh, 14, 433 of which, or 34%, were government-run, 
and 825 or, uh, or 66% were privately run hospitals. However, the healthcare expenditures were mostly from the private. That's about 63.1%, while government expenditures was only 36.9%. The future pro uh, target of the Department of Health is for universal healthcare through the uh, Philipp Philippine Health Insurance Corporation. However, currently most are still out of pocket or if ever through uh, health management organizations. Uh, this insurance, however, covers only about 7 million uh, of the people. So we're still far from our universal health care uh, plan. There are certainly barriers to um, the disease uh, to, and they cause a lot of a burden. Uh, these are inequalities in access to health care, uh, physical and geographic access, you, as you can see, we're, we're composed of several islands and they're only connected, uh, uh, most of these islands are connected only by ferry boats. Of course, poverty is still a problem in the country and po poor public health information campaigns because again of the physical and geographic access. Going to the eye care um, situation, we have 1,762 ophthalmologists registered and 1,000 of each, which are in the national capital region. So you can imagine how many, um, that there are islands that don't have any uh, ophthalmologists. We have five ocular oncologists now in the Philippines. We used to be just two since 1999, and we were added, uh, thankfully, by another three uh, um, two years ago. And, uh, but all of us are in the national capital region. Because of the barriers, uh, we have no existing national cancer registry to date. We also don't have a, an ocular oncology res registry. And uh, most of the registries are just hospital-based or institution-based or uh, registry for particular cancers. There is no, currently there's no published data on the epidemiology of uh, eye cancer in the Philippines as a national uh, registry. So I'm going to be talking about um, what we experience here at the University of the Philippines and Philippine General Hospital, where I come from. This is the, the UPPGH, the, the one that houses the first ocular oncology service here in the Philippines. And it also houses the National Institutes of Health, of which um, part of that is the Philippine Eye Research Institute, which houses the first and the dedicated ocular pathology laboratory. Most of the... Um, studies and um, data that I'll be quoting will be coming from uh, this center. So uh, in 2002, Nyalangel and Wang uh, presented that the eye cancer amounted to 0.7% per 100,000. This is based on registries from Manila and the Rizal province. This is just a small part of uh, um, uh, the country. Uh, Domingo, Manganib, and Castro uh, uh, reviewed, had a 10-year review of the pathology of submitted ocular and periocular specimens at the uh, Philippine Eye Research Institute. This revealed 394 intraocular tumors, 373 of which were malignant, and retinoblastoma comprised 90.9% um, of the intraocular tumors, while UVL melanoma only accounted for 8% and metastatic 1.1%. Uh, mind you, of course, these are specimen run um, registry or um, survey. So um, a lot, I would suspect, um, well, for the UVL melanoma, we have been doing enucleation for most of them. And so um, this might be a good um, reflection of what we see in the PGH. Um, but then, um, for metastatic tumors, of course, we don't do uh, eye removal, most of the cases. So um, there must be more metastatic tumors than uh, what is reported. So for UVL melanoma, the report says that they see about um, two to three new cases a year at the pathology. In my own practice, I see about, yes, the same thing, about two to three in private practice and combined private practice and public practice. Um, because of the limited options for treatment, most go to um, enucleation. And if it is possible, I do eye wall resection. 
Um, sometimes, a very few cases, I had to, uh, where I see the, the case uh, quite small or early in the disease, then I could refer them to, uh, for outside referral for plaque bracket therapy. However, of course, there are limitations and you could expect limitations in terms, in terms of finances. Retinoblastoma, as I, as I previously mentioned, is really composed of really the, the majority of the cases that we have. In a review from 1967 to 2008, um, this, this span, we saw that a rise from uh, 40 per 100,000 ICE cases to 237 per 100,000 ICE cases. There is a this decreasing trend, um, especially from the 1977 to, uh, 1997 to 2008 of uh, extraocular retinoblastoma. We're catching them a little bit earlier. However, we still see the intraocular stage uh, to be at the advanced stage of DNE as what was uh, similar to what Malaysia is reporting. However, we are in increasing our salvage rate of the better eye with bilateral retinoblastoma cases. At present, uh, our modalities include uh, neoadjuvant chemotherapy, laser thermotherapy, cryotherapy, intravitreal chemotherapy, and of course, IMRT. Uh, we are still in the process of trying to incorporate intraarterial chemotherapy, and I've been looking for plaque bracket therapy uh, to be here in the Philippines since 1997, and we've had uh, very uh, little uh, chances so far, and I'm hoping this uh, talk now will... Uh, will progress. For ocular surface neoplasm, uh, the, the, the specimens submitted are usually squamous cell carcinoma and carcinoma in situ. And our management for these are excision cryotherapy, topical chemotherapy. And we wish that there was plaque packet therapy for uh, particularly for those lesions that uh, Arun mentioned where it, there's deep sclera invasion. So in... Um, Summary, I talked about frequency of ocular and ocular adnexal tumors, discussed with you the complex healthcare system, as well as the public health burden and issues in Philippine health. Um, we hope that in the future, because of the cost of the uh, uh, brachytherapy, but also the need for brachytherapy here in the Philippines, we hope for strategies for regional resource sharing. So that ends my talk. Thank you uh, again for uh, inviting me here. Yep, thank you, Dr. Mercado, for giving us that, that good overview of the situation in the Philippines. Um, it looks like you have a, very, a lot of needs, but uh, yeah, it would be good if you can find out a way of introducing this kind of service for your country. So next, we'll have a speaker, Dr. Mayang Pamata, who's a radiation oncologist uh, at the uh, Faculty of Medicine, University of Indonesia. And she will be uh, talking to us about the ocular oncology a situation in the in Indonesia. Dr. Maya. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Gavin Tan. So may I share my screen now? Yeah, please do. Uh, can you see my screen? Yes. One slide show. Yes, okay. Thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, good evening, respected professors, doctors, uh, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Mayang. I'm here with uh, Professor Suhar Tati Gondo Wiarjo, or Professor Tati, the president of IRAS. We are radiation oncologists from the Chipto Mangun Kusumo National General Hospital in Jakarta, and also speaking on behalf of the Indonesian Radiation Oncology Society, or IRAS. So um, we were actually contacted to do this presentation quite at the last minute but we are excited uh, nonetheless to learn the possibility to welcome ophthalmic brachy in our country. So thank you for the opportunity. And we will share briefly of the cancer situation in our country, especially on eye cancer. So uh, maybe most of you already know, Indonesia is also an archipelago country and we have more than 17,000 islands divided in 34 provinces. Well, of course, this brings a special kind of uh, geographical challenge for supplies or distribution. 
And as of for our population, it is estimated right now, uh, the number is 273 and a half million people. Now, uh, let's talk about cancer here. So if we see the Globcon data, the total number of new cases last year was 396,000 cases with breast cancer as the highest. But also when our national survey of basic health research, there is a significant increase of cancer prevalence in five years. So 28%, um, well, that is quite a worrisome increase. And even more worrisome is that until now, 70% of all cancer cases were found or diagnosed at advanced stages where mostly it is already too late for any curative treatment to be considered. So also this is for the, from the global can data, the highest number of cancer cases in women in Indonesia are breast cancer and cervical cancer. And for men, it's lung and either colorectal or nasopharyngeal cancer. And pediatric cancer cases was estimated uh, for three to 5% of all cancer uh, number. And our cancer patients are insured by the National Health Insurance, the BPJS Kesehatan, which cover most, if not all, the medical treatments. But you can imagine how high this burden financially is for the country as also cases were already advanced when we found them. So as cancer is one of the catastrophic disease, it costs around 17% of all total cost burdened by the National Health Insurance, and it is always at the top three of the highest diseases burden along with heart disease and chronic kidney disease. And in terms of the actual uh, rupiah spent, there's also a significant increase from 2013 to 2018 spent for cancer. And now if we try to look into more data that we have, from our center's hospital-based cancer registry, which is the National Referral Center. The data for seven years is that we all we have almost 2,000 uh, cancer patients aged 10 years old or younger. And the cases were highest for leukemia and then for uh, the ones in the eye and at Nexa, which is 14% of all cancers in this age group. And if we look into this group even further, we can see that the patients are mostly five years old or younger. So well, I think it is no surprise to everyone here so that with retinoblastoma, we always deal with the youngest of our patients. And also uh, from our hospital, still from our hospital cancer registry, is that we actually get that, that the proportion of uh, cancer in this age group uh, from zero to 10 years old is higher than what it is estimated at the community, le community level, which was three to 5%, but in the hospital in our center, it's 6.5%. I think most probably, probably this is because we do not have many pediatric cancer center in the nation so that many, many cases get referred to ours. Now, uh, focusing more on the eye topography now, uh, we don't have a lot of data, but eye cancer uh, covered about 1.3% of all cancer patients in our hospital. 55% uh, of these are in the retina and 64% was again in the age group of 10 years old or younger. And as for melanoma in the eye uh, at our center, I believe it's about four to five cases per year. And of all eye cancer uh, cases of all ages, 49% were sent for radiotherapy and 67% of these are retinoblastoma. And as we have mentioned uh, previously that mostly almost all were already in uh, really advanced stages, not just for the child cases too, but for adult too, which can be seen some examples in these pictures. And um, to give a brief overview, probably on our resources in the nation, 
Uh, we have only 46 pediatric oncologists for the 273 million people of Indonesia, with only 25 centers capable of treating pediatric cancers. Fortunately, we have more numbers of ophthalmologists, which is about 3,000 doctors, but I believe there is still a limited number for consultants or fellows for oncology or pediatric ophthalmology. And as for radiation oncology, currently we have 123 radiation oncologists working in 46 centers in 16 provinces. And we have, uh, in terms of machines, we have 59 the next uh, 20 cobalts, one tomotherapy, and 21 brachytherapy centers. Well, then, um, of course, uh, resources are limited, but I think we are all striving to do our best. And at least uh, speaking about our center, we try to provide integrated comprehensive cancer care where every case will be treated with multidisciplinary team approach. Of course, for eye cancers, we are all working very closely with the ophthalmology team, the medical oncologist, pediatric oncologist for child cases and all other relevant fields. And I believe many of them are in attendance here tonight also. So if you would like to discuss more. And with that, I conclude my presentation. Thank you for your patience here. Yep. Thank you very much for that, that overview of the situation in Indonesia. And thanks for being able to put something up in such short notice. So I, I think we have a very clear picture that uh, there, are, there are challenges. There's inadequate uh, availability of service in our, our region. And of course, the difficulty always in, in Southeast Asia, it, it's not one monolithic block. It's many, many, many countries. And even when each country look at Indonesia and Philippines, it's hundreds and thousands of islands, which can make access quite difficult. So I think for the, the next portion, um, the organizers wanted me to just talk a little bit about my experience, how I got the ball rolling in, in our system in order to be able to provide the service for my patients. Just give me one second to share my slides. Okay, so I think most, most of the, the, the prior speakers have, have come from a background where there's already some orca oncology service that's available. But I think it, this tends to be uh, quite neglected or underserved in Asia. And if we don't have a specialist orca oncologist, sometimes it's served by a, a combination of maybe retinal specialist for certain things, oculoplastic surgeon for certain tumors. But it's really important that you first set up a orca oncology service that allows you to have good characterization of your uh, tumors in your region and, and enables you to provide kind of standardized and specialist, specialized care. My own experience, I did a second fellowship at, at Jules Stein where there was an oncology oncology service. When I came back, I, I started a service that wanted to look specifically at intraocular tumors. Prior to that, the tumors tended to be again managed by a, a mishmash of retinal specialists and oculoplastic surgeons. But still here at that point of time, the primary treatment available for uveal melanoma was really a nucleation, although as is the case in, in all the prior speakers' uh, experiences, you can always refer overseas for brachytherapy. But of course, that, that, that reality is it's not so simple to get patients to, to travel for treatment. There are various factors and barriers that prevent it. I mean, just look at the pandemic that we're in now. I think it's extremely difficult if, if anybody needed to try and uh, cross a border, even if it's to access a potentially life-saving or, or site-saving care um, for, for cancer. And the initial problems that I had, I'm sure it will be common to all, all the other uh, countries is they look at, they, I think a lot of times the health officials, um, funders and all that, look at this service as something that's very, very niche. And it's often rejected because of either lack of demand, it's not caught as effective, and you don't always have the right partners being an ophthalmologist to, to set the ball going. So for, for us, one of the things that, that um, kind of helped me get over this hump or provided a little bit more attention to what is still relatively a very rare cancer is, is we had a, a kind of um, a well-known sports person. This, this gentleman is, is uh, actually a, a used to be a Navy serviceman. He was very unfortunate to have lost the 
function of both legs, one arm and a couple fingers due to an accident. And he, 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 he became kind of inspiration because he came back from that to be a, a successful Paralympian. And what happened is he very, very unfortunately, a few years after his accident, um, he developed a, a choroidal melanoma. Um, of course, I mean, what happens in, in a lot of times in our countries is because of the lack of awareness, the choroidal melanoma was picked up quite late. So his case would not have been eligible for uh, brachytherapy anyway, but he was able to then shine some attention on this tumor. He helped us on some of our, our philanthropy efforts. And one of the things he wanted to see was, of course, that we would be able to help patients moving forward who had a condition similar to him to be able to at least spare their, their globe and save some site. So I think you really need to make sure you have good local data. It looks like a lot of the groups already have that. You need to have patient uh, advocacy. You need to find the right partners. Uh, and for me, it was finding the right partners in, in the radiation oncology service uh, of our National Cancer Center. You need to kind of look at cost benefit analysis that works against you a lot of the times. But I mean, sometimes you, you do need to look at the alternative uh, modalities and inflation does lose the globe and site for life. I mean, people always think, talk about the, the latest modality being popular being proton beam therapy, but that's phenomenally multiple times more expensive than setting up plug bracket therapy. And of course, um, in our case, and, and perhaps uh, in your cases as well, sometimes looking for philanthropy is quite important and useful. And as I mentioned in my talk earlier, it's going to be a multidisciplinary care. So we really need to get buy-in from the various uh, players, uh, whether it's your radiation oncologist, radiation physicist. I mean, in our case, we also got nursing team and we had an ophthalmic pathologist who was interested in looking at the molecular features of this tumor. And everybody is needed to contribute to provide a service. And it, you, you really need to try to figure out ways to get appropriate training for everybody. So in our experience, once we set ourselves uh, in mind to set up this service. We got buy-in from our administrative people and our funders. Then we went along, we, we did set up some additional training. We had a training trip um, at the time was to Spain, which uh, actually uh, Ica and Ziegler helped us arrange and Transmedic as well. And then from there, we developed our own treatment protocols that gave us treatment criteria, the follow-up protocols, protocols for um, the surgery as well as for radiation safety. Um, our consideration, of course, plug choice is one of the things that you, you would need to encounter and think about. And I, I think Dr. Singh earlier compared the two common, I suppose, more common uh, radioactive sources that are used, whether it's iodine or ruthenium. Both have pros and cons, but I think in Asia, a lot of countries start out with ruthenium because the advantage is it's got a longer half-life. So that allows you, in theory, to use the plug many, many more times. And the more times you use it, you obviously do reduce your per unit cost. It has some advantages in terms of radiation follow fall off and less collateral damage, but and it's a good choice for retinal blastoma, which seems to be the one of the areas of need in the countries surrounding Singapore. And um, but of course, that limitation is that because of the high sterile dose that you will need for a, a larger tumor, and generally the safe size that you can treat is only about five to six millimeters, and then you need to balance that with the fact. In Asia, a lot of the choroidal melanomas tend to present late. But if they're all presenting so late, they would need a nucleation anyway, then that's not as big a consideration. And when you actually go about doing it as ophthalmologists, you really need to figure out and navigate certain things which you can't do without the physicists and the radiation oncologists, whether it goes to radiation licensing requirement, facilities to store, assemble, and dispose of the radiation sources, all the safety protocols that need to be developed and they also uh, emergency protocols for the banishment of incidents of somebody who asked in the Q&A what happens to patients who, who may, for example, die while the plugs in situ. You need to have protocols to manage this. And of course, uh, it is not going to be easy. If you really need to get the right help. It, it can just be diagnosis of cases that can be challenging. Um, and you really try need to try to look for friends and, and mentors, uh, whether it's in the region around the world. I'm, I mean, I'm our, Dr. Singh has been very, very instrumental in providing mentorship to a lot of people around the world, including in Singapore. I mean, my, my previous fellowship um, advisor, as well as people that you meet overseas. I mean, I've met Carol through the Michael Society, and she's been very helpful whenever you needed input on cases as well. So don't be afraid to ask for a second opinion. And again, 
um, I think trying to find the right kind of philanthropy or even special interest groups like this can be very, very useful. Then of course, at the end of the day, you really need to figure out how to justify the cost. I mean, our oncology services is something that needs more chair time. You kind of need a minimum amount of volume for financial uh, sustainability and maintenance of skill set. But you need, I think it's not something that's impossible to justify when you look at the impact of loss of eye and permanent blindness. And really, once you've got this going, the benefit to the patient and the reward to the physician can still be significant and very, very satisfying. So yeah, just to conclude in, in my own experience, uh, having a good ocular oncology service is the first important step. Uh, you need to figure out how to meet those challenges then uh, from the cost justification perspective when you want to look at psychiatry of the brachytherapy service. You need to get together a multidisciplinary team with the right training. And a lot of times getting the right advocacy and philanthropy can be helpful to get things started. And the outcomes where you actually are able to achieve globe, globe and site saving can be very, very rewarding. Um, so thank you for your attention for this. And so I think we have heard a lot about uh, local ocular treatment. We have heard about the situation, the regions around us. And uh, now we're going to hear a little bit about um, the actual radiation uh, planning considerations uh, when you actually get down to delivering the service for your patients. And for that, I'd uh, like to uh, introduce my colleague and uh, friend, Dr. Xiao Tian Rei. Um, he's a radiation oncologist from the National uh, Cancer Center in Singapore. And I, I think without him, we would not have the service available in Singapore for our patients. So uh, Dr. Xiao, would you like to? Uh, thanks, Kevin. Yeah, okay, so let's get started. Let me see. Great. Okay. Thank you, um, um, Gavin, for um, everything. So, um, so let's just start with uh, talking about the radiation planning itself. So, uh, it was interesting to hear uh, what the doctors from the regions have been um, describing. And so, um, some of the things I'll be saying will be uh, may not be necessary what Dr. Arun may be doing, but it's kind of when we set up the program, some of the adaptations, some of the things that we had to do to kind of get the program going. So I think some of the, our uh, colleagues from the neighboring countries may actually, can actually learn from some of our experiences as well. Um, so so uh, being a radiation oncologist, so I think I feel obliged to just give a slide on the oncological management of um, choroidal melanomas. And then we'll talk about the planning itself as well as the, some practical considerations. Yeah. So this is my one slide on choroidal melanoma. I think a lot of it's been mentioned before. Um, Importantly, I think um, it's been mentioned that the um, diagnosis is clinical and imaging, and the biopsy is not is done only at the point of uh, implantation of the um, plug. So uh, we've actually, I, um, fortunately, unfortunately, we've actually among our patients, we've actually had quite a few interesting cases for which uh, we've had to adapt along the way. So uh, we've had actually patients who were referred to us for suspicion of melanoma. And we had one patient who actually turned out to have uh, metastatic prostate cancer, another patient with uh, metastatic uh, lung cancer. And the patient with prostate cancer, we weren't, very, we weren't sure at all whether it was melanoma or prostate cancer. Eventually, we kind of sat on pain, started hormonal therapy, and then the tumor just uh, shrank. So it's always important to keep in mind um, that we do not have histological diagnosis and uh, it's very important to keep all the uh, differentials in mind. Staging, we mentioned before, um, systemically CT PET scan as well as MRI liver because predominantly the choroidal melanomas like to metastasize to the liver and follow up for both uh, local uh, recurrence as well as distant um, uh, metastasis. Here as well, we've kind of had to adapt depending on um, patients' finances and also whether the patients are based in Singapore or they come in from overseas. Uh, wherever possible, we try to alternate uh, maybe six monthly CT PET scan and MRI livers and um, if possible. Right, so now we come to the theory of the radiation uh, treatment itself. So as mentioned, so we have, uh, there are two main types, IOD125, which comes in seeds. So this is um, um, as a kind of a silicon silastic holder and the uh, iodine 125 seeds which are four millimeters long are placed into these holders and then there's a gold shell that goes over it. And then there's the rutinium 106 which is a kind of a solid radioactive um, plug. 
So we've also had the opportunity to use both of these uh, because we had uh, patients come along who required um, um, uh, each of these uh, plugs. So this was mentioned before. So a lot of the evidence that we have comes from the COMS study, which was actually a three-arm study. It was a very, very well-designed three-arm study looking at small, medium, large tumors, so to speak. So our interest is actually in the RCT of the um, IOD125 um, plug bracket therapy versus in nucleation uh, for medium-sized tumors. Medium-sized tumors being um, uh, anything that's probably more than three millimeters in height to about maybe uh, 10 millimeters in height. Um, large numbers, and I think as Gavin mentioned earlier, long and short of it is the control rates, and mortality rates, everything is almost equivalent. And this really kind of established the, the role of uh, plug bracket therapy in uh, management of ocular melanomas. Now, um, this is a uh, comparison table um, to show the um, the differences between the Routinium 106 plug as well as the IUD 125. Um, the Q&A was mentioned, so um, for pediatric patients um, and smaller tumors, Routinium 106, uh, because of its uh, profile, the, uh, the radiation profile as well as the thickness of the plug is more appropriate. So the, uh, the IUD 125 is about maybe three-ish millimeters thick, so it's a bit thicker, it's maybe harder to implant for uh, younger patients. Is this a half-life? So um, as Dr. Arun mentioned earlier, some of the considerations we had when we had to, um, when we were starting off with our program was cost and um, the number of patients, the number of throughput that we were going to have. So we, if, we were, if we were going to get IVD 1 to 5, which is a half-life of two months, how many patients were we going to get in those two months? Because if we were going to get one patient in two months, then the patient was basically going to bear the cost of the, the batch of IOD125 seeds, whereas we could get more patients, then you could split the cost among patients. So routine 106 has a half-life of one year. The type of radiation emitted is different from routine uh, IOD125, and this accounts for the differences in the radiation profile, which I will show later. And then um, this radiation profile determines how large a tumor we can treat with routine 106 the maximum thickness of the tumor is about six millimeters. If I do one to five, it's about 10 millimeters. The width of the tumor, the diameter of the tumor for both is about 16 uh, millimeters. So what was I talking about in terms of the uh, dose profile between the differences between routine 106 and IOD125? So this is a uh, graphical rep representation of the eye. And this is a tumor right here. So as mentioned earlier, we usually try to uh, treat the uh, melanoma to a minimum dose of 85 rays. So the apex of the tumor should get 85 rays. The rest of the tumor will probably get way more than that, but the apex of the tumor should get 85 rays. Now, how do we understand this um, picture? So I think um, for the few radiation um, oncologists and radiation therapists in the audience, this is basically a kind of a cross section through the central axis of the um, tumor. The plug is here. And then if you follow the line, this is how the radiation dose falls off as you go away from the center. And this is the kind of a cross section of it. So first let's look at this red line and this dotted red line. This is both, this is dose profile of ruthenium. You can see this is nature, this is physics. This is how ruthenium, how the radiation uh, falls off from the ruthenium plug. This is the gradient, it's kind of fairly similar um, because this is routine. This is the gradient for iodine, and this is the, the gentler gradient of iodine. Once again, fairly similar. So now, if we, if we look at the tumor that's about five millimeters in height, if we use a, a routine plug, we can get the dose here 85 gray, and then the dose falls off because of the steep curve, it falls off fairly quickly, and then the dose to the rest of the eye is much lower. Whereas if we were to use the iodine, which is this light blue line, to get 85 grays to the apex of the tumor, the dose does not fall off as fast and end up with a higher dose to the rest of the eye. However, if you have a tumor that's about seven millimeters thick, to get the same 85 grays, you will end up, you need to um, increase exposure. That means you need to keep the plug in the eye longer. And what happens is, it's not so much a fall off here, this is fine. The problem is that the rest of the eye, which is here, 
scleroderm is going to get a very, very, very high dose, and this is where you might um, affect the eye. So for a larger tumor with a um, iodine, because of the gentler slope of the dose gradient, um, it is uh, more feasible and safer for larger tumors to use the iodine plug, and for smaller tumors, it's the glutenium plug. One thing to note, though, is that while the steep dose gradient is useful for sparing normal structures, for sparing normal structures uh, with the glutenium plug, it also means that it's less forgiving, which means that the placement of the plug must be uh, must be uh, spot on, so to speak, or else you may end up under treating the tumors as well. Right, so I think we've kind of gone, gone through the complications, possible complications um, of the uh, uh, treatment. So I think I'll probably skip over it. As Kevin, I just want to point out, and this um, what I like to tell the patients when I consent them is that this is um, uh, not necessarily a vision sparing, a function sparing procedure, but uh, hopefully a group sparing uh, procedure. So a lot of the uh, numbers, the uh, the the dose and, and the, the uh, parameters that we use for the radiotherapy planning is from the American Brachytherapy Society consensus guidelines for uh, plug therapy of uvian melanomas. This you can probably find this paper online. Okay, now um, now we come to the kind of the itty, the nitty gritty details of the radiation planning. So there is one software out there, plug simulator software. Um, out there that is used for this treatment. Um, I think there's only one and it's written by a physicist from the US. Um, so you have to uh, kind of find this online and then to download it and install it. Okay, uh, there's some issues with it as well. I'll talk about it later. Um, primarily planning is 2D for those radiation oncologists out there. Uh, you understand primarily planning is 2D, although I think the latest uh, iteration of the software allows for 3D planning as well. But the principles of breath the general brachytherapy principles are fairly, fairly straightforward for um, uh, plug brachytherapy. Um, there are various sizes available for both the iodine and as well as the glutenium plugs. Generally, you want to treat the tumor base with a two millimeter margin around, so leading to a tumor base plus four millimeter diameter plug size. Um, as mentioned, we will try to prescribe a minimum of 85 rays to the tumor apex. And the numbers we look at in terms of um, OAR stands for organs at risk. The numbers we look at, the doses we look at uh, for the organs at risk are those on the macula, the optic disc, the sclera, and the lens. Now, this is the plug simulator. This is a website for, uh, to download the plug simulator. Now, the problems with the plug simulator, I, I might as well just mention it now, is that I think the, um, the person who wrote the software, I think he wrote it on the Mac. So you can only use it on the Mac. So in terms of your startup costs, you need to make sure that you have a Mac as well. And then depending on um, um, which version you download, because I think the person who wrote it, as he, up, um, as he upgraded the software, he used a different Mac to write it. So some of the software, the versions of this software is not backward compatible. So if you download a certain version of the software, you need to have a certain you know, version of the Mac OS to be able to run it. Right, so now we come to talk about um, the uh, IOD125 um, plug set. So this transparent plug is basically the dummy plug, which is, um, helps the opt uh, ophthalmologist um, determine the initial placement of the plug. This is the silicon um, uh, silastic holder to place all the iodine seeds and this is a gold shoe covering at the back. So this is a blown up picture. So this is a very blown up picture because each of these slots is about four, four millimeters long. This is the back and this is the front kind of thing, uh, image. So with the plug simulator software, this is the plan that is generated. And these are basically numbers. So um, once the seeds are this is a standard placement of the, of the iodine seeds. And then we have the treatment point, which is the apex of the tumor. For this tumor, it's 6.8 millimeters, which will, be, which will receive 85 rays. And then with the numbers reported for the um, macula and the various other organs at risk. And this is a kind of the 2B, 2D plan that's generated from the plug simulator software. Uh, this is just a easier 
apologies, in, uh, I, should, I should mention that a lot, most of my pictures are taken from Vivic. So this is just a graphical representation of this. This is a tumor, the 85 gray, uh, so those line, the red, and then the, the fall off the doses around the eye. Now, um, okay, I'll come to that later. So what are the planning objectives? So a lot of these planning objectives are taken from the ABS guidelines. And this is the part where I said, uh, we've had to adapt some of these numbers or else the program would never have been able to take off. So one of the num one of the guidelines is that the um, the dose would actually be delivered. I think the ABS guidelines might be three to five days, but for us, especially when we were starting off, I think we had a patient. Um, I think the first one was maybe slightly less than three days, and then we had a patient that um, at, was treated for I think up to seven days. Really depended on it. Really depended on the um, um, the size of the tumor. Because the larger, the taller the size of the tumor, the longer you need to leave the plug in so that you can reach the exposure is long enough to reach the target dose of 85 grains to the apex. It also depends on when we got the plug. So, um, so all these are radioactive isotopes and they have a half life. So uh, the longer you keep the plug, so for example, you get the ruthenium plug and you, if you treat the patient in January 2021 and you and the, and the plug stays in for three days. And if we can't have the same patient coming in in maybe December 2021, and then um, in uh, the initial patient, it will be three days. And for the same patient coming in at the end of the year, it will be six days. So basically that's the half-life, is the decay of the radioactive isotope. So it really depends on what which isotope we had, how long we've had the isotope. And then, uh, so we had to kind of, kind of bend the rules a little bit in terms of how long we kept the, the um, plug in. Similarly for the dose rates, um, this is from the ABS guidelines, but we've had, um, because I think when we had our first patient, we we had to kind of confirm and guarantee the patient that it was a goal for the patient. And only then do we kind of uh, make the purchasing order to bring the iodine seeds in. So the dose rate for the first patient was actually higher than the, than the numbers um, mentioned in the ABS guidelines. As for the rest, the prescription point so will be to the if the tumor was more than five millimeters the prescription point will be to the apex of the tumor so if it was six millimeters we will prescribe 85 grays to six millimeters so on and so forth but if the tumor was small uh, let's say if it was four millimeters that but we will still prescribe to a point in space which is five millimeters we will not prescribe to four millimeters we'll still prescribe to five millimeters the 85 and these are the critical normal structures and those limits um, even during our time in Valladolid in Spain um, these numbers are more of a guide and not necessarily uh, strict, uh, strictly observed uh, depending on the location and the type of the tumor. Uh, but roughly these are the numbers that we, uh, we, we were looking at. Slara 4400 grays, macular 40 to 50 grays, optic nerve 40 to 50, but preferably lower. Now, now here we talk a bit about the practical considerations and this is a lot of it coming from uh, our own experience of practical considerations. So it's all and well to say, let's get started. Even if you've got all the money and all that, you bought all the equipment, it's all and well to say, let's get started. But then after that, you know, we started facing a lot of situations we never kind of anticipated. So a few things that I would like to bring up. So the handling and storage of IoT125, uh, because of the type of radiation that's produced, I want to find basically uh, you use lead, you use lead continue to to, um, to store it. But routine 106, because of the beta particles produced, you you will usually need a low Z material, a low atomic number material, like aluminium or acrylic, uh, to contain the routine. Okay. Then we also face uh, issues with sterilization because um, a lot of our central sterilization unit and in the operating theaters, they're not comfortable sterilizing um, uh, radioactive, uh, uh, radioactive materials. So we had to kind of work, work out the protocol. We had to speak to the uh, nurses and the staff there uh, before they agreed to allow us to um, do the sterilization. Then there was also the issues with assembly and disassembly, especially with the IOD uh, 125 um, plug. And then, like I said, unfortunately, unfortunately, we actually had quite a few interesting patients Usually we try to keep the patients outpatient so that we don't run problems. Uh, uh, so we don't have to come up with a whole bunch of new protocols to manage inpatients. But we did have one patient who had very bad OSA, uh, frosty sleep apnea. 
and we had to keep the patient inpatient throughout while she had the um, plug in the eye. So that patient, we had to, once again, we had to go to the ward, we had to speak to the nurses, uh, we had to arrange a single room, we had to talk about nursing care and all that for this uh, for the patient while she was uh, still radioactive. And so we wrote a whole bunch of protocols. So you can see we had um, protocols for sterilization of the plug, assembly and disassembly, um, guidelines for inpatient the staff, staff. We have an information template for the, um, uh, for the patient, a card for them to hold in the wallet. We wrote, this was a um, uh, eight page ocular bracketary consent form and uh, the protocol and radiation protection plan as uh, Gavin mentioned earlier. So we had all the paperwork done before we even got started. And so some, and some of the other practical issues is that, so when we bought, when you buy the seeds, so we, um, obviously the, um, the manufacturer actually has a whole array of uh, plug sizes, um, but for practical reasons, when you're starting off, it will be quite difficult to buy a whole array of plug sizes and kind of mix and match the tumors you might see. So we end up buying like the, I think the second largest plug size, um, I think it's um, 18 or 20 uh, millimeters. So uh, that size comes with uh, 21 slots um, uh, for the uh, 21 iodine slots. So we bought the kind of the second largest one so that kind of we can kind of use it for a wider range of uh, tumors. So when we buy the seeds, it comes in a very small packet. And so the first thing we had to kind of figure out was how do we account for the seeds? How do we pour it out and count and make sure that when we bought 21 seeds, there really are 21 seeds. So we got the workshop to kind of make a little template for us. So then we bought the seeds, we kind of place it into the little slots so that we can make sure that um, uh, we got what we wanted. Okay. And then this, we learned this from Spain and then and we got to make it for us as well. So this little gadget here is a very nifty gadget. So it's actually connected to a suction, um, to the wall suction. And then we have this silicon holder, the small uh, silicone holder, which the suction keeps the holder in place and which allow us to place this little tiny four millimeter iodine seeds into the little, um, in the positions. And then we open a little bit drop of antibiotic cream inside the shell and then we put the cap on. So this is how this is. Uh, so we had uh, we had to practice this using dummy seeds, um, and uh, the initial part was not easy because uh, all of our visions are uh, uh, failing. It was very difficult, really, really difficult to actually see um, the seeds and placing and placing it. Um, see, so this is the um, sterilization of the rutinum plugs. The same uh, with the iodine seeds is even more difficult. But as you can see, this whole tree is normally filled with. Um, uh, surgical uh, uh, equipment and stuff, but when when we said we wanted to autoclave the routine plug, the everybody cleared out. They said, okay, you have the machine to yourself for X number of hours. So we had the luxury of just autoclaving one single implement here, the, our routine plug, um, uh, uh, before uh, each insertion. And then there's a dis disassembly as well. So this is done underwater. This is done underwater, and then so the, basically we kind of peel off the silastic holder. So now you can actually see a rear view of how small this thing is. So the rest of my earlier pictures were actually all unmagnified. So, so the moment we kind of open it up, the seeds will kind of spill out all over the water. So this is a really, really tiny. So we have a um, upside down lab container to kind of keep it, kind of keep it uh, shielded. And then we'll take it out one at a time to kind of clean it and then put it back and put it into another lab container. And then I think we've seen some of the pictures that Gavin has shown already. Um, this is the dummy plug, placing the actual plug um, and the ultrasound. But I do want to show, this is our hardworking physicist um, checking the um, dose around the patient after the insertion has been done. Um, at about one meter from the patient, it should be about 50 microsieverts per hour. Okay, and then after that, the patient actually goes on with a kind of a special pair of that um, goggles, which we specially bought for the patients. And then we have um, a list of instructions for them to, um, to note when, when they go home. Now, I, you know, I think I would just like to spend the last one or two minutes just to kind of um, actually bring up some of the issues and hiccups that I actually went through. I mean, um, uh, we've had, We've treated uh, quite a few patients successfully now, but we actually, we had a lot of kind of a startup um, issues and hiccups in the beginning. So as I mentioned earlier, 
we had to figure out how to get it sterilized, how to get people uh, to agree to sterilize uh, our radioactive plugs and seeds. Um, the software I mentioned earlier. Um, in fact, I think uh, the other hospital in Singapore, National University Hospital, were hesitant to take on this project, partly because the, um, there was, I think, no formal FDA approval of the planning software. As I mentioned earlier, we have overcome the problems with the experience and assembly of the plug. Uh, one of the things I want to mention was that when we assembled the first plug, we dropped one of the seats on the floor, then we dropped the four millimeter seat on the floor. And then so that evening we had uh, one physicist and one ophthalmologist and one radiation oncologist crawling on the floor with the Geiger counter looking for the missing seat. Um, so that was the, one of the early problems. Then we also had to figure out implantation removal times. So it's like we had to figure out like what's the best time to uh, implant it so that we don't have to come in on uh, Saturday, 2 a.m. or 3 a.m. in the morning to take it out. So we had to figure that out as well as to um, make sure that OT, the operating theatre uh, slots were available. And then this is mentioned earlier, the cost per patient and the patient load. Um, in Singapore, in, the health, uh, in our system, um, if one patient, uh, a lot of costs, May have to be end up may end up being transferred to the patient depending on how often the plug is used again. And finally, I do want to mention that when one particular patient, a routine uh, patient, um, there was actually sl a slight calibration uh, error uh, when we receive it. So we do we do uh, we do not have the equipment yet. The ion chamber we do not have the equipment yet to actually perform our own QA of the seats of the plugs that we receive. So we kind of base our numbers on the certificate that comes with the equipment that we buy. Um, so we, there was a slight calibration error on one of the um, plugs. Um, and so in the end, it ended up with a, was, was a big issue. There was a big difference in the uh, dose to the tumor, uh, to the organs at risk. There was actually an increase in dose to the primary tumor, but there wasn't a significant change in the dose to the uh, organs at risk. So uh, it turned out fine. Uh, in the end. But this is another thing that we need to look into going forward. So going forward, as I said, we need to look into internal QA. So our physicists need to buy an ion chamber. So we actually have an ion chamber for prostate seed brachytherapy as well already, but apparently that's not the same for eye. So we need to buy a separate ion chamber for that. We want to start looking into using IOD125 seeds of different activities. And we saw that in Spain is actually a very exciting thing to do. So once again, these are the 21 slots of the plug. So currently we use the same activity. So the same batch, the same batch that comes out from the oven, in the commas, they're placed inside. So we come up, when you use this plug, the radiation fall off is symmetrical all around. But let's say you have a plug that's very near the optic nerve of the macula, then you can actually use a lower uh, seeds of lower uh, activity nearer this so that you can have an asymmetrical uh, kind of a dose fall off so that you can uh, lower dose to the macular, the critical structures, and uh, higher dose elsewhere. So we, we need to, uh, we will be interested in looking into that in the future. And of course, as mentioned earlier, we want to look beyond melanoma. We might consider treating metastasis. I want to look at treating uh, retinal blastomas in children. And finally, I think a lot of you might know that proton therapy is coming to Singapore sooner or later. So I guess um, it is not a matter of um, um, you know which is better. Um, they actually they all they are actually complementary. They all have a role. So we we need to kind of work, kind of work into a kind of a comprehensive protocol for um, eye tumors, where is the guidelines and the um, indications are clear. Which ones to be referred for prolonged therapy and which ones to be referred for plug therapy, and so on. Yeah, and so this is our uh, the team that we work with. We have the OT staff with the ophthalmologist, me, the physicist, uh, not in the picture, but uh, also the radiation therapist who also help me with the protocols and the consent forms and stuff like that. Yeah, that's all. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, uh, Dr. Xiao, for telling everybody about the practical issues. And like I mentioned, I think without having the whole team sorting out all these issues, it's actually not so easy to execute it from a concept of I want to treat the patient to actually getting the plugs into the patient's eye and out of the eye at the right timing in a safe and effective manner. So I, I think um, we thank everybody who has spoken and now we're going to invite uh, Carmen from 
Eckert and Ziegler to talk about the uh, brachytherapy solutions that they have available. Carmen? Thank you for this kind introduction. Hello, everybody around the world on this Saturday morning, noon or evening. Take your choice according to your local time. I'm Carmen Schulz. I'm the product manager for ophthalmic products from Eckert and Ziegler Babic, and I'm very pleased to have you the opportunity to present our products to you today in this multinational workshop. Before I start my presentation, please allow me to say thank you to all the speakers who have been so kind to share their experiences with us so far and to our partners at Transmedic for organizing this great workshop today. For those of you who do not yet Eckert and Ziegler Babic, let me give you a brief introduction. The Babic GmbH was founded in Berlin in Germany in 1992. Since then, we were the only global providers of ruthenium eye applicators worldwide. Today, Babic is part of the Eckert and Ziegler Group, one of the largest providers of isotope technology for medical, scientific, and also industrial purposes. Starting from the business with eye plugs, Babic soon added other products for brachytherapy to their portfolio. Here, I would like to mention in particular that we offer our low dose rate ISO seats not only for treatment of ocular tumors, but also for prostate and brain tumors. This is the reason, oops, this is the reason why nowadays we, call, we understand ourselves as your partner in ocular brachytherapy. Many well-known university clinics, but also regional hospitals or private clinics are relying for ocular tumor treatment on either our ruthenium eye applicators or on COMS applicators with high activity seats. A significant number of clinics can offer both to their patients. Our ruthenium eye applicators are meanwhile used in more than 40 countries and we keep adding new ones every year. You can see them marked on this world map in dark blue. Some years ago, one of these new countries was Singapore when Transmedic and Eckert and Ziegler Babic started their combined activities in Southeast Asia by supporting the Singapore National Eye Center and the National Cancer Center Singapore to open up their service for ocular tumor treatment with brachytherapy products from Eckert and Ziegler Babic. The other speakers have already given you introduction on different methods of tumor treatment earlier. Hence, in the following, I will focus on brachytherapy solutions. I will start with a ruthenium applicator. For more than 40 years now, ophthalmologists have favored ruthenium eye plugs due to their superior design and technical features. For all of the applicators come First of all, the applicators come already loaded to the clinic and can be reused for one year owing to their long half-life of ruthenium-106. Ready loaded means that the radioactive substance is tightly included as a layer between the silver backing and the radiation window on the concave side of the source. The result is a thin plug of only one millimeter thickness which is therefore in particular ideal for treating children with retinoblastoma. But what is so special about the better radiation of this plug? Well, the nuclide has the really comfortable characteristic of decaying to rhodium with a one year half lifetime. So it serves like a long living supply of rhodium and rhodium itself then quickly decays to stable palladium while emitting beta minus particles with a maximum energy of 3.5 MeV, which is important for this successful treatment method. The unique feature of the ruthenium eye applicator is the very steep dose fall off. It's resulting from the fact that beta radiation is stopped in tissue much faster than gamma or X-rays. Hence, the 
vast majority of the energy deposited in tissue ends up in the first millimeters next to the source surface, killing successfully the tumor cells at the base of the tumor and up to the tumor apex. You can get an impression of this by this beautiful little autoradiograph here. It has been achieved by positioning a radiosensitive circular foil in a plane, including the central axis of the applicator. And it makes clear that this applicator presents the essence of brachytherapy. The dose is matching the tumor and there is significantly less dose to adjacent tissue. As a result, when using ruthenium-106, there is no need to strive for total dose reduction. Rather, physicists tend to use a dose of at least 100 gray at the tumor tip because this increases control, tumor control without causing any additional damage to surrounding areas. The dose recommendation of the ABS guidelines was determined for iodine 1 to 5. Currently, a group of the astrobrafix group is working on a more detailed recommendation in this regard. The autoradiograph also shows that the tumor height is including the sclera thickness and should in general not be larger than six millimeters, which is shown here by this yellow arrow. In order to accommodate the different tumor positions and sizes, a certain variety of different plaques has been designed. The blue area in this illustration shows the active surface of the plaques, and I have marked for you the most popular types here with red check marks. As you can imagine, the circular types can be used for almost all peripheral positions, while when treating tumors close to the optic nerve, a notched plug is necessary, and these larger notches fit for anterior tumors. I do not want to go into any clinical details in my presentation, but I would like to cite Professor Bertel D'Amato who emphasizes the benefit of using transparent templates to improve accuracy of the plaque positioning. This is so important because if a surgeon can be confident about the plaque position, then he can reduce the safety margin without increasing the recurrence rate. With reduced safety margins, many patients would enjoy better vision. And furthermore, fewer patients would have recurrences because the surgeon feels happier to increase the apex dose without damaging disc and fovea when he is sure to have made an, a, a, um, um, a good plug placement. Therefore, we now offer these Damato templates for our customers. The full portfolio will be available with CE Mark in Europe next month and the registration in further countries will follow soon. The Damato templates do not need any reprocessing. They come sterile for single use. As mentioned before, the applicators can be reused up to 50 times and therefore we developed a safety and sterilization container for you. The sterilization container consists of an internal container made of aluminium, which shields the better radiation, and the external stainless steel container is used to attenuate gamma radiation. The slots between the pot and the lid allow the steam to go in and out while the radiation is shielded. For the preparation of the ruthenium eye applicator, we have set up a and validated a process which is described in the reprocessing guide. This includes details how to manually clean, disinfect, and pack the product for sterilization. I showed you in the last slides the great features of ruthenium. Nevertheless, as you learned before, also iodine has its importance for larger tumors. 
I like to cite this paper from Professor Zing and his group in Cleveland because they have clearly shown the difference between ruthenium-106 and iodine-125 if you compare it in an eye. On the right-hand side of this uh, illustration, you can see the dose distribution of ruthenium-106. As, as we could appreciate earlier in the autoradiograph, it's quite limited to a small area resulting in low side effects and therefore excellent results for tumors up to a height of five millimeters. But for those patients suffering from larger tumors, you still might want to help them keep their eye. In this case, iodine comes in. It allows to treat larger tumors because of the deeper penetration depth of the gamma radiation. As you have seen before, iodine 1 to 5 comes as small sources, so-called seeds. Iodine has a half-life of about 60 days, and the seeds contain the radioactive material bound to a ceramic rod. It's a low energy gamma source. Nevertheless, the titanium capsule is very thin and allows the radiation to penetrate. The activity per seed is usually four to eight millicurie when loaded into comms applicators. The seeds are assembled by the physicist in a silicone insert, which is mounted in the plug shell of the appropriate size. After steam sterilization, the treatment can take place for a couple of days. Then the applicator is removed and dismantled and the seeds and the plug shell can be reused. Here you can have a short glance into the operating room and see samples of both plugs, plug types on the patient eyes. And on this slide, I show you a list of the cities where ruthenium-106 is used. All of these clinics are doing their best to fight ocular cancer with brachytherapy. So thank you again for your time to learn more about our reusable ruthenium-106 eye applicators, the sterilization container, the dermato templates, and the comps applicators with iodine seeds. Thank you for your attention. So now we'll go on to our <clears throat> question and answer session. I think there are quite a few uh, questions. I think some of them have been answered by the speakers online. But let, let's just, just take, take up, um, bring up some of them have, that have not been. So I think there are a few questions about the indications for ruthenium plaque. And I think, um, I'm not sure if Dr. Singh has already answered that, but typically <clears throat> the indication is, is for up to 5 mm. Uh, I think Carmen also mentioned, but we do know there have been publications and groups that have tried to stretch it slightly beyond. and. Again, it's, it's when you manage the treatment, it's all about risk benefit ratio. The minute you're going beyond the prescribed uh, maximum size, you're going to risk under treatment at the apex. Um, at the same time with ruthenium, we're gonna risk the fact that your sclera will very, have a very high dose. Uh, but I suppose in, in countries where they don't have iodine available, then, then they may have to adapt to make do to what they have available. <clears throat> There's a question about 3D planning. Uh, I think in Singapore, we've not ex have experience with this yet. I don't know if, if Arun, do you do 3D planning for your uh, treatments? We don't. No, we don't, but uh, we had a project trying to compare the two and see whether one was superior or the other, but you could use ultrasound or CT or any kind of imaging MRI for 3D. We go by 2D and our control rates are better than 95%. So we really don't see much. Yeah. I suppose that the main advantage would be in a very oddly shaped tumor, but in general, melanomas tend to be quite symmetrical. So probably the advantage of the of 3D planning might be slightly less in those cases. Um, we do have quite a number of questions about how long you can use these applicators. Um, I think from, from our perspective, you know the half-life, you know the activity that you get when you buy the applicator. 
it really depends on what kind of tumors if you're going to treat. Um, as I think Henry mentioned, the longer you keep the seeds, the longer you need to expose to get the same dose. So at a certain point, you will exceed what we recommend as the minimum dose rate or the maximum exposure period for a particular tumor. And of course, it will be different for different size tumors. Smaller tumors will need less uh, exposure time. So at a certain point, it would not even be able to treat your smallest tumor and then you probably need to dispose of it. I would estimate maybe typically it'll be about two half lives maybe. Yeah, depending on what, what activity you start with. If it's a high activity seeds, you might be able to do one and a half to two. But in the lower activity seeds, it will not last you. You will not be able to use it for that long. So uh, I think an important point, and you touched upon the ABS guidelines, Dr. Roy did, that the dose rate should be 50 to 150 centigrade per hour. So you cannot do it in 24 hours if you want it, and you can't do it in two weeks if you want it. So there is an optimal time frame, and that affects the efficacy and toxicity. And the range, according to American Brachytherapy Society guideline, is about 50 to 150 centigrade per hour. So if you think about, let's say, 100 centigrade per hour, and you, the dose is 85 gray. So you're talking about 85 hours, give or take. So that's four days, three and a half days, something along the range. That's the optimal. So you really want to be in the range. So there's a limit to all this. Do Dr. Roy, you agree with this? Yeah. Yep. So, um, so, so there are actually a few things uh, that I think that, that we have to consider here. So, um, uh, one is, of course, is the radiobiological uh, effects of, with, uh, of the dose rate. The other thing also is that if for some reason you keep it for too long, the other thing is also we do not want to keep the plug in there for so long because of risk of infections and stuff like that. So all this can, uh, kind of uh, play a role as well. I, in my mind, uh, low dose rate, that means that if you have a plug that's kind of old, a low dose rate, um, if you keep it in long enough, and if you can make for certain compensations, in my mind, and this is not guide, this is not the guidelines, but just my so-called expert opinion, it probably is still fine. But if you have a very high dose rate, then you will really run to risk of um, toxicity, which are not uh, you're not aware of. Yeah. So I think there's quite a few questions on on kind of like safety and requirements. Um, one of them is on special precautions uh, in terms of. The, the operating theater, uh, Kateri, you want to speak about our experience? Yeah, so actually, um, all in, um, we, because uh, in, in NCC, we actually do also do, um, some of you may aware, we also do things like intra op um, uh, radiotherapy for breast cancers and stuff like that. So the precautions we need for uh, this ocular bracket therapy is less than that for uh, intra op um, radiotherapy. But those are x rays. This one, the range is actually very low. So precautions are to mainly for uh, Yavin, because she's the one who will be in closest proximity to the patient and to the plug. Um, we, we basically latch you um, and um, we've actually thought of the idea of wearing the kind of, we have this kind of lead equivalent goggles, but they're very clunky. And then I think Gavin says it's just very difficult to look out of it. So I think the principle is this, be fast with what you do when you're next to the patient. But as, um, so don't change anything when you, you know, when you're next to the patient, but once you're kind of like a meter or two away from the patient, you're fine. So no special shooting or whatever protection uh, in the OT as well, this needs to be quiet. But I want to point out that there are major and several guidelines that regulate use of radiation. There are hospital guidelines, state guidelines, national guidelines, and there's nothing more regulated than radiation business. So Absolutely. you don't have to have any physical precautions while putting the plaque and removing the plaque for yourself, but the whole setup that you're doing uh, has to be cleared and, and you know everything documented and measured. So there are certain regulations you yep. got to follow and they vary from place yep. to place. Yeah, so that's why we had, we had to write a whole radiation safety uh, protocol. We, had the radiation, we have a assigned radiation safety um, um, sure. officer to look at everything and then um, we, Actually, that's why the, uh, the sterilization and all that is actually all done by us because we are radiation workers. We are licensed radiation workers. So only we are allowed to handle all these things. Yeah. And so Gavin had to become a radiation worker as well, right? 
Yeah, so so a lot of times <laughs> it's the licensing requirements that, yeah. it, especially as ophthalmologists, prior to this, I never dealt with anything that ha had to do with radiation before. So it's really, um, I think it's something you can't navigate without having the right partners involved. And but I think overall, this I think the concept the concept that you do need to also understand is the safety factor is actually pretty high because the fall off rates, drop off rates in terms of radiation is, is quite quick. So, I mean. Um, if you, if you saw in the OT, we do measure what kind of uh, exposure there is if a Geiger counter at certain distances on a patient just for as a safety documentation. But if at one meter, it tends to be very, very low. And it's like, if that's practically what everybody is doing for safe distancing these days. So, um, but we do give our patients, for example, the, um, in, for the uh, iodine patients, it will be either lead line goggles or a, a lead shield. And I think for the, Routinium is a routine. plastic. Kind it's of a thing. plastic acrylic or aluminium uh, protector just to reduce the, the the exposure to to persons around them. So I think just to add on, a lot of it is is actually education, um, especially of the staff, uh, the staff who are not familiar with handling uh, radio so called radioactive patients. At one meter, is thirty microsievert per hour. I think that uh, healthcare workers, uh, radiation workers, are allowed to receive two million sieverts. Per hour, I think, um, um, a year or something like that. So the exposure rate to us, even not just to the public, but to us, even is actually fairly low. But a lot of it's just um, education. So I think when we went to the ward to educate the nurses, we talk about the amount of radiation you'll get when you take an airplane ride and stuff like that. And they will get you'll get more radiation when you take a, I don't know well, in the past when you used to take airplanes. I think flying from here to New York or whatever, you get more radiation exposure than you will to nurse a patient and things like that. Yeah. Okay. So, so there, there was a question about combining therapies. Um, uh, personally, with I mean, in that particular question, is external and brachy. I don't think that's something that I've heard of being practiced. But I know people combine brachy therapy with with other modalities like endo reception. We've personally not have experience. Uh, I don't know if, if Arun wants to com comment a little bit on that. Yeah. So I'm not for in favor of endo reception. I think radiation in certain right cases works very well. If you do want to resect for whatever reason, then you should plug them first, sterilize all the cells so they're all dead, let's say, and then you can do what you want. Yeah, I, I do agree. Conceptually, putting a retractor in there is definitely going to seed cells all over the, the eye. Right. I don't think it's something you can... It, it would be easy to do with a high success rate as a primary therapy alone. Then I think I think when we talk about combining those question of combining EBRT with brachytherapy, so that is done often with many other cancer sites with cervical cancer and esophageal cancer and other cancers as well. But here, same thing. So typically, it's always been kind of uh, calculating the equivalent dose when you combine a standard radiation, um, excellent radiation with a um, high dose rate kind of um, uh, brachytherapy. Um, so I think unless you have studies to show efficacy of a certain dose regimen with EBRT and BRAC -E, it's very hard to recommend what kind of um, doses you can do. So I guess we will we, we were to combine, the main thing we would do is just to make sure that the organs at risk, uh, the dose of the organs at risk are not exceeded. That's probably how we would do it. We'll like, kind of give the maximum we can give with external beam and the maximum we can give with BRAC -E, um, in a safe manner. So Dr. Rui, I can give a simple answer. Mm. External radiation is for diffuse disease. Right. Brachytherapy is for local disease or focal disease. And they don't the, overlap. The, 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 the issues and sometimes um, I, and I extrapolate from my other can cancers, like for example, some guy who might have had external beam to the eye before. And then now he's got this new problem or, what, or recurrent or whatever. And then you say, no, now I'm going to try brachytherapy. And then you start thinking, you know, how much did the nerve get previously, et cetera, et cetera. And sometimes it's kind of a, sequential combination, but we still have to remember the previous dose exposure and stuff like that. And that'll be the tricky part. Yeah, so toxicity will be cumulative. I mean, yes, that. yes. Yeah. So I, I want to point out one thing. I, I listened to all the people and I know many people in this region and all about, you know, education and lack of local resources, etc. So I, I do want to say that the Coal Eye Institute is run by the Cole family who gave a lot of money. And now they've given some endowment specifically for oncology, it's called Cole Fellowship. So for to supporting people to come and learn 
about anything in ocular oncology. So we have fellowships for the next five years that have some special endowment for that. So if anybody's interested and you are half up there and doing what you're doing, or want to do, we're happy to support and, and uh, provide some educational experience or anything else that you need. So we are open to help. That's all I can do. Thank you. Uh, great. Thank you very much, Arun. Yeah, I, so, so I think, I mean, in my own experience trying to start this up, I think looking at philanthropy was quite, quite useful because, I mean, the, the cost, a startup initial cost can be, it's not prohibitive, but it, sometimes it's difficult to get um, the insurer or the regulator to see value in that in, in our context. Um, I think we've answered most of the questions. Does anybody else on the, the guest panel or any of the other regional speakers have any questions you'd like to ask? I think there was a question about how long does it take to do a plaque or how much does it take to do, I would say anything about 45 minutes to an hour is a kind of a good time for yeah. a plaque therapy. Yeah. I would also say there's, there's a bit of a learning curve initially yeah. when you're doing ultrasound guided and all that, you would want to keep give yourself a comfortable OT block because yeah, that, that's a kind of a thing that the initial learning curve does, does take you a little bit longer. Do you do all your cases under general anesthesia? Me, no, I do under the block. Okay, I mean, we've been doing uh, under general. Um, I, I know when I was in the US, they did some cases under block, some under general. So yeah, I think we're, we're not doing it as quickly as you do. We don't do as many cases. So, so no. yeah, it was a lot easier to do it under general then. Yeah, there's an advantage in the general. You can teach the fellow, you can talk, you can take some time. But if you have six cases to do, then you need to move along. So for Mac, for us, it's easier to turn around for the patient. Yeah. I think with that, we're done, huh? Yeah, I think, I think there's one more question about the, the process and preparation for the patient. Uh, would you like to comment on that? So I have a, an assistant who does all that. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so, you know, you tell the patient, that's what the diagnosis, that's what they need. And then my assistant comes in and goes through the whole process of logistics, what testing they have to do, whom they're going to see, uh, kind of all the risks and benefits and alternatives and complications. And that takes maybe about 20 minutes. So we have it all very well structured. And that's about it. But I step out of the room because, you know, you can't spend an hour with the patient. So we tell briefly and then some patients need more time and there's not enough time to comprehend everything in one visit. Sometimes they'll call back or we have another visit with them just to go over some questions that they may have. It's not that difficult uh, and it's not that complicated if you just have some clear bullet points to, to mention that so this will happen and this will happen and this will happen. Yeah. Yeah, so I think in our experience as well, it was setting out a, a protocol where you already know your full list of uh, risk, benefit, complications, the potential outcomes. So it's very easy for somebody, whether it's the doctor, the resident, somebody to help to communicate all of the information to the patients. And sometimes they do need some time to, to think about it. Um, and then the rest of the process be, be, uh, goes on be, behind the scenes. Uh, it's the same as any other surgical procedure. You then need to do your, your back-end planning for the surgery, your coordination to make sure the plug gets delivered at with the correct planning parameters and uh, what time and so on and so forth. I just want to add one comment and because I think there was a question about um, whether we keep the patient inpatient or outpatient. So for us, a small country like us, we actually prefer the patients to be outpatient because the logistics of keeping a reductive patient in the ward, which we can do, but it's, it just adds more hassle and stuff like that. But in, in big countries and when we were in Spain, in big countries where people might be coming from far away for treatment, then you're going to have to keep them inpatient all the way uh, while they're reductive. Yeah, we give the patients an option. They can go back home if they have support. Uh, some are elderly, they can't do whatever. So we just keep them in the hospital. So it just depends. You can go either way, safety-wise, no problem. Okay, I think it's it's almost 10.30. I think we've had a very, very good two and a half hour session. Um, I'd like to thank all the speakers today. I think it's been a, a great session. Um, it's something, again, as I mentioned a little bit, uh, underrepresented in Southeast Asia, and we hope that will change. Uh, thank you very much for Arun for waking up early and Carmen. Um, I don't really know what time it is <laughs> in Germany. But yeah, <laughs> might be missing lunch. And of course, all the, the speakers, the rest of the speakers and the audience who stayed on uh, 
till till such a late time in order to to speak speak to all of you. And I, I think um, Transmedic is also recorded this, so that they might be able to provide of uh, some kind of viewing system to for people who want to have a look back yes. at the talks again. Thank you, Dr. Tan. We'll, yes, we'll definitely send a follow up. Uh, we'll send a follow up email together with the link so that um, participants can view this again uh, on whatever they have missed. Okay. Well, thank you so much for inviting me. It's been a privilege. Thanks, everyone. Bye bye. Thank you, Arun. Have a good evening and good day, everybody. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye.